Live from the Improv in Tempe, Arizona, this is the Adam Carolla Show. Adam's guest today, John Holmberg. With Gina Grad on news, Bald Brian on sound effects, and a spirited round of blah, blah, blah. Plus, Adam Carolla is unprepared. And now, since it's Rosh Hashanah, Adam's dad asked him to buy him a shofar. Adam Carolla! All right, guys, thank you so much. That was the test intro. Now we need a little more energy. Here we go. Live from the Improv in Tempe, Arizona, this is the Adam Carolla Show. Adam's guest today, John Holmberg. With Gina Grad on news, Bald Brian on sound effects, in a spirited round of blah, blah, blah. Plus, Adam Carolla is unprepared. And now, since it's Rosh Hashanah, Adam's dad asked him to buy him a shofar. Adam Carolla! Hey, thank you guys. Sorry, I was uh, sorry, I was late. Uh, it's John Holmberg over there, everybody. Thank you. You know, from uh, Holmberg's morning sickness, uh, weekdays, 5:30 to uh, 10 a.m. on uh, 98. Whoa, excuse oh, us. KUP. Social that distance, was, Adam. That's right. Sorry about that. All right, I made a I made a couple of notes here. First off. Um, where I'm staying, they're in full Halloween effect, <laughs> except for it's 118 degrees <laughs> outside, which is always weird to me when it's insanely hot and then you have the big pumpkins and the gargoyles <laughs> and uh, the headless horsemen. You know, you know what it is? I'll tell you, Halloween is not a hot weather holiday because it's all loosely based on the Reese's peanut butter cup. <laughs> and as soon as it gets over 96 degrees, the Reese's peanut butter cup goes from the fucking best thing you've ever put in your mouth to, how do I get this shit out of the wrapper? <laughs> Who do I gotta blow to get some of this out of this fucking wrapper? It is, Reese's peanut butter cup is awesome at room temperature. It's awesome when it comes out of the refrigerator and it's awesome in Northern climates. But when it's 114 degrees outside, you just pull it open and go down on it. Like you're <laughs> going down on, it's like going down on a homeless person. I know. <laughs> Thoughts, John? Uh, well, the last time I went down on a homeless person, the diarrhea wasn't a problem, so I didn't. Re I wasn't reminded of that. The uh, I don't remember it tasting so much like a Reese's cup. I have to be honest. Well, I don't normally go down on homeless people, but when you don't, when you don't want to break a twenty, and someone's asking you for money, like, what are you gonna do? You're out of options. I uh, I had I. I flew out here a couple hours ago on Southwest and uh, like, uh, by the way, like I, I now realize, <clears throat> you know, 
You know your smoking friends when uh, they, they made the decree, no, no smoking on flights, right? And so you had your smoker friends going, well, it's a six hour flight from New York to LA. And they were like kind of freaked out, like they'd be just smoking out on the curb and then they put the nicotine patch on and they go on the plane. I'm that way with booze now on the flight. Like somebody announced, we're not gonna have booze on these flights anymore. And I'm out on the curb with a Boda bag with bathtub gin in it going, I gotta get on that flight. And uh, I went to the Burbank airport. You, if you guys want uh, it, a, a, little, a little tip, and if you wanna know uh, science, I was at the Burbank airport and I got myself a vodka soda water with lemon in it. And then I got onto the Southwest flight you know the thing that's interesting about boarding a Southwest flight, it, 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 it speaks a lot to your sort of dynamic psychologically. Like I was like, what, what group, what's our boarding group? I was B1, I was the first one in the B category. And I was looking at my, my boarding ticket and I was like, oh, B1, feeling pretty good about myself. Like I'm the number one in the, in the B group. And then we got there and there was nobody in the C group. And I was like, fuck this shit. Where are all the losers? They're supposed to be behind me. So I went from happy with my B1 to pissed off because no one else was miserable that they were behind me. Like, do you guys ever do that? You get in line at a Starbucks at an airport and you're like, shit, there's like 12 people in this line. And you're like, I'm in this line. And then you're in it for a while and you're like, why aren't people behind me? Like, how come, why am I the last person in this line? Shouldn't it some, after 20 minutes, shouldn't I be the middle person in this line of 12? Why is nobody sidled up behind me? But I got a, uh, a vodka soda water with lemon in it and uh, I was drinking it and we we're boarding the plane and I thought, I'm gonna drink my, I'm bringing this drink on the plane and I went to get on the plane and as they were checking my, my ticket, she said, uh, what's in the cup? And I said, uh, just the tears of virgins. <laughs> no, I said, uh, I said with a straight face, I went, soda water. And she went, okay. Cause she wasn't like gonna put her pinky in it <laughs> and then lick it like Jack Lord in uh, Hawaii Five-0, going like, away. that's, all right, it's an old reference. But the point is, is I, I, I go, soda water. She goes, okay. Then I get up and I walk up the ramp and I get onto the plane and the flight attendant said, what's in the cup? And I went, didn't you hear? <laughs> soda water. And she goes, okay. This is why you have to drink clear booze, everybody. <laughs> don't fucking get sucked. Don't get stuck on the IPAs or the scotch. Because if you get into the vodka, you can go anywhere with this thing. I was asked three times, what's in the cup? And I just kept saying soda water each time. But you are going to have to travel with your own booze, is the uh, moral of the story, John. I always find it hilarious whenever people talk about traveling, too, that as men, I don't know if people know this, Adam, I don't know if you do this, but while you're on the plane after you've boarded, as a man, our arrogance kicks in to the point where we'll watch women walk by and go, if this fucker goes down, that's the one I'm nailing. Like we could get an erection and maintain it during a plane crash. It's in our brains that we're that powerful of, you know, visceral men that it's like, yeah, she's uh, two rows behind me. If this thing starts going into the mountains, I'm going into her. Also, <laughs> I don't imagine it's happened often but what if you had picked out your rape victim, John? <laughs> no, 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 she's, she's homeless, Adam. It doesn't count. You, there was fire coming from the, from the engine on the right wing. You were heading toward the mountain. In fact, you did then charge your victim with an erection. In fact, have sex with this person. And then at some point, the pilot goes full Solenberger and pulls it and pulls the thing off and gets on the blower. It's like, we found it. We found a light. And, you're, and you're, you're pulling out screaming, no, no, no. Still worth it. Yes. There's two heroes on that plane. That's right. I was, uh, somebody was reminding me, uh, Mike August was reminding me that the last time I was here was 
probably 10 years ago, right? The last time I did stand up on this stage. Were you here? All right, so this, this very weird, be careful what you ask for thing uh, happened when I was here about, about a decade ago, which was, like, so out of a movie. So I was, uh, I, I got canned for my radio job, and I was, I was literally just, I have no, I had, uh, I had twins. Uh, my, uh, my twins are, who are 14 now, were you know a year and a half, two years old, whatever. There were young twins. I got fired from my radio job, and I had no way to make money. I had no radio job, so they said, "Can you go out and just do stand-up comedy? Like we'll book you in comedy clubs." And I was like, "I'm not a stand-up comedian. I, I don't have an act." And they said, "Just put something together. We'll sell tickets. We'll put you on the marquee." And so what I did is I did this sort of interactive thing where I had like slideshows and I would talk about, "Oh, and this is one." I'd kind of this is your life kind of stand up with training wheels is, is basically <laughs> what it was. Like I wasn't just doing a rat a tat tat joke thing. And so it was at this club, and I was I was a few months into doing this, and I was at my hotel couple miles from here, and uh, Sarah Silverman, stand-up comedian, she called me, and, and she said, uh, hey, I, Adam, I'm, I'm doing this uh, benefit. Can you play this benefit? And I said, yeah. And she said, where are you? And I said, uh, I'm, in, I'm in Arizona. I'm, I'm doing a comedy show. And she said, yeah, I heard you're doing stand-up. What's that like? And I said, well, I'm not really doing stand-up like you're doing stand-up, Sarah. I'm doing this whole sort of AV, you know, PowerPoint presentation thing. It's like, it's, it's, it's cheating, it's cheating. It's stand-up with training wheels. And she said like, oh, that's nice. And I said, yeah, yeah, I'm not really doing stand-up like what you would do. I'm just doing like a kind of presentation. And she said, okay. And I hung up the phone, I said, I gotta go do the show. And I came to the club, which was this club before they remodeled it. And I got to the club, and it, both shows were sold out. I did the first show, no problemo, PowerPoint presentation. The second show came around, and about five minutes before the show started, the manager came to the green room and said, the light bulb's out on the projector. We got nothing. We got nothing. And I, and I was like, you got nothing? I don't have anything either. And they're like, it's sold out, it's a 90 minute show. I was like, I, I got nothing. He's like, we don't have a bulb, so you got nothing. So figure it out. And I got a little buck slip and I made like five beats on the buck slip. And I was walking out on stage and I was thinking, fuck, I just told Sarah Silverman that I don't really do stand up. I just do this sort of cop out PowerPoint presentation slide bullshit and I'm not really a stand up and now I'm walking out on stage and the bulb is gone and I have to wing it for 90 minutes and it went really well and when, when we were done the guy who normally runs the slide projector said wow that was killer I guess you don't need me anymore and I was like no I don't but <laughs> was, he was joking but uh, I wasn't but that that was that was the last time I was here you were digital carrot top 10 years I, ago. I was right. Know. I was digital carrot top. And there was a local DJ named Meat. Was it Meat? Yes, it was Meat. This guy was named Meat. He was like this burnout guy named Meat. And he was supposed to bring me up on stage. And last show, the last night, Meat goes, <laughs> he goes, hey, uh, first off, he said, I got a sugar mama. And I was like, you got a sugar mama. Because this guy, this guy did not look like he was worthy of a sugar mama. And I said to him, how does this work? Because I want a sugar mama. How, what do you get with a sugar mama? And he literally, he looked at me and he goes, how's my sugar mama work? I go, how's it work? He goes, see this t-shirt? I go, yep. <laughs> he goes, she got it for me. <laughs> I was like, you gotta go down on a Reese's peanut butter cup in July, and all you got's a t-shirt with a dragon on it? But uh, Meat, and this was at this club too, which made me laugh, like the very last night, Meat goes, uh, he goes, uh, hey man, uh, my dad's in the audience. And I go, okay, good for you. And he goes, uh, can I do about 10 minutes worth of comedy? 
And I go, I don't know, mate, we're sold out. I don't think these people are here to see you. <laughs> you got a dragon on your T-shirt. And he's like, I'll just do 10 minutes. And I go, I go, I don't think it's a good idea. And he goes, my dad's sick, and he's in the audience. And I go, OK, do 10 minutes, meet. And we're walking through that back door over there before they remodeled this thing, like we're coming through the kitchen. And I said, go do it. And he came out, and instead of bringing me out, he did the world's longest, least funny story <laughs> about nothing. And I was standing through that exit sign back there. And Mike August, who we were just standing with, who booked me, was like looking at me the whole time, going, what the fuck did you tell him? He's doing 10 minutes out there. I go, his dad's dying, and now he's dying. I think that was the last time I was here, John. Does it count as a sugar mommy if you met her at Kohl's? <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, he had shorts and the shirt. Well, at least he wore shorts. Could we ever, could we ever, is anyone ever at that point where you could wear a shirt, short combo, like that matched? Like, you know, when you, you know when the, when the black NBA ballers reunited with his biological father <laughs> and he's wearing, the collared shirt that matches, like he's got the burnt orange shirt that matches the burnt orange It's like shorts, a baby onesie. The baby and he's onesie. wearing like, t he's wearing tasseled loafers <laughs> shoes as well. And you're like, I could never pull that shit off. Tommy Hearns used to wear full suits with shorts. Yes. And they matched, like he cut his slacks and, and it looked ridiculous, but it was Thomas Hearns. But Nobody Thomas said. Hearns was such a devastating knockout artist as a boxer that they were like, Thomas Hearns started his career as the Motor City Cobra. Yeah. <laughs> he was the Motor City Cobra, and about halfway into his career, we are like, one nickname isn't good enough for you, Tommy. <laughs> we need Tommy the Hitman Hearns. So he was literally, he was the Tommy the Motor City Cobra Hearns, because he was from Detroit, and he punched like a fucking cobra. And then he went to Thomas the Hitman Hearns, and the very first joke I ever told on radio was I was working. So the way I got into radio is I was Jimmy Kimmel's boxing coach on K-Rock in Los Angeles. So I was working as a boxing coach in Los Angeles at a like white collar boxing place. And there was a uh, morning zoo type. Do you know this story? Have you ever told this I story? Think, I think I know a little bit about it. This, yeah. this was like a morning zoo type thing where um, Jimmy, the sports guy, who was Jimmy Kimmel, was going to fight Michael the maintenance man on K-Rock for as, as a morning show stunt. And they're like, we need boxing trainers. And I was working as a boxing trainer and a, and a carpenter. And I was like, I'll train one of them to box. And I kept calling the radio station, the morning show. And eventually I showed up and I became Jimmy's uh, boxing coach. And they were putting me on the air. So I'm, I'm looking at you, John, because you get how this goes. You'd yeah. interview the trainer a week right. before the fight, like how's the progress, blah, blah, blah. But I was a budding comedian who was a boxing coach. So I was like, how do I be funny doing this morning radio show and actually be like a legitimate boxing coach? So the first joke I ever told on the radio was uh, in 1994. It was probably about uh, May 1994, right before the boxing match. And Kevin and Bean said, we need to interview the coaches and see how the progress has gone. And so they were asking me about Jimmy, like, how's the progress? Now, I didn't even care if I got Jimmy or, or Michael, the maintenance man, but uh, I got Jimmy. And they said, uh, you know, how's it going? I said, well, it's going good. I said, um, we're looking for a nickname, you know, because you need a good nickname if you're going to be a boxer. And uh, I was thinking... Uh, Jimmy, now, I was thinking, like, he's Italian, so, like, the Italian tornado or something like that. And then he's from Brooklyn, so I was, like, thinking, like, maybe Brooklyn assassin. I was toying around with that idea, but uh, after seeing him spar, um, 
We just, we just went with Jim. <laughs> that was my first joke I ever told on uh, Kevin and Mean. There is Jimmy. This is, this is me, delighted. This is me. That's young me watching Jimmy get pummeled by Michael, the maintenance man. As a betting man, just looking at this photo, I can tell you who's going to win the fight. Just visually, Jimmy had no chance. And, it's, and you did a great job training him. I don't think he's ever been in better shape. <laughs> Jimmy, uh, he looks like an egg out of a shell. I think that's funny. He's wearing my old faded uh, boxing trunks I wore in, like, I, I wore in the uh, Golden Gloves in 1982. And then also, the thing that was funny about Jimmy is I was training him. I realized, like, immediately, he didn't want to train, and I wanted to talk comedy immediately. <laughs> so I was like, he'd hit the speed bag for, like, 10 minutes. I'd go, why don't we go upside and get a, uh, we'll get a Snapple? Go up top and get a Snapple. Like, trained out in the... We're in a basement. I was like, well, there's a cafe up there. We'll get a Snapple. We'll talk strategy. And then we just go up top, and we talk about Benny Hill for four hours. <laughs> and that was basically his training regimen. So, uh, yeah, Jimmy Was did the that. maintenance man, like, had you gotten the maintenance man, would it have been you and the maintenance man doing the man show? Or would it have worked <laughs> with Jimmy, had his trainer? How did your life change because of this? Oh, my God. It like was, if you would have switched. It, Nobody really fully understands that, which is Michael, the maintenance man, worked at the radio station. He was there for like three years. Jimmy had started like seven weeks earlier. Michael, the maintenance man, was a brother. Jimmy looked like a cannoli that had too much stuffing in it, like the, the cream was bursting out of the end. And so I was like, I want to train Michael the maintenance man because he's been there and he's more athletic and he's bound to win the fight. So when I called up, I was like, I'll, it, no one ever answered the phone, but I was like, I wanted to train Michael the maintenance man. But when no one ever answered the phone, I just showed up at the radio station. When I showed up at the radio station, Michael the maintenance man was like with the street team giving away beer koozies at the uh, four-day tire exchange and like our leader or something, and Jimmy was there. Yeah. So, when, so when I banged on the door, Jimmy is the one who came out, and the rest is history. And by the way, uh, now he's hosting the, he's hosting the Emmys tonight? Yeah. yeah, I just talked to him today. He's like, I'm, I'm hosting the Emmys. I'm like, good, I'm going to... <laughs> I'm going to Arizona to tell stories about you. Yeah. <laughs> A perfect time for Hollywood to start handing itself awards, I think. Yes. Yeah, I yes. think it's a great time yes. right now for them to, to start giving out some awards for all their hard work during the pandemic. I love all those commercials, like uh, all those things like, Hi, I'm Jennifer Aniston. I'm in my gymnasium now. Here's how I stay busy with my kids. And it's like, no one feels sorry for you. <laughs> By the way, I do like the, I, I like the high water mark for Hollywood for all the celebrities that are in like quarantine, which is, I do shit with my kids. <laughs> Normally I pay a Guatemalan woman to do shit with my kids, but in this particular instance, I am doing shit with my kids myself. <laughs> Woo! Heroes, the heroes, heroes of parenting. Heroes who stay home and do things with their kids. Actually interacting with those things. It's, yes. it's unthinkable for us average folk. Yes, I know. I know. Are you, wait, you have kids, John? No. Good God, no. I had a vasectomy three years ago, and every time people talk about their children, my balls tingle and say thank you out loud. Yeah. yeah I, I, I just never had the drive. I don't have the patience, and I'm way too selfish. I always want to be the favorite person in my house. Oh, really? I get jealous of the dogs. Like, not jealous, but like, where's my fucking cookie? Like, you're giving them right. treats all... Every time they take a piss, they get something. Right. I come out with pecker tracks on my pants, and I just get a bad look. Yeah. Taiji. Yeah. No, I got, uh, I got twins, and, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds great. My balls are just going... Ball! I, I, 
I like, you know, everyone talks about wanting a time machine so they can like go back and kill Hitler or something <laughs> like that. I just want a fucking time machine so I can take my snot nosed twins back to 1974 and have my fucking parents raise them <laughs> in the San Fernando ba Valley with no goddamn air conditioning for 10 minutes. And then they'd, cl they'd come back to present time and they'd be crying and hanging on to my leg and weeping openly and sobbing, begging for forgiveness. Jesus Christ, think about how we all grew up. Like my, I, my, my fucking, I don't know how you grew up, but like my family was like, I, you know, I'd say to my dad, uh, the uh, ice cream trucks coming down the street, can I have a quarter? And my dad would be like, a quarter? Are you trying to kill me? <laughs> my dad had a 1976 El Camino. Oh, sweet. That was really sweet, but we lived in Northwestern Indiana and his parents lived in Northwestern Pennsylvania. And an El Camino, for those who don't know, not the roomiest vehicle, right? No. But four people. Bench seat all bench the way. Bench seat, but my dad would scoot it up eight inches and stuff me and my sister behind the seat behind and drive to Pennsylvania. Behind the bench seat? Yeah. And I look at kids today you and it's like... You can't get a fucking twenty-two yeah. rifle behind <laughs> yeah. the well, you got bench an, yeah. seat of an El Camino. Eight-year-old and a five-year-old in the SS El Camino blazing across Ohio. And, uh, and the worst part about it was... He wouldn't scoot up to be to make us comfortable. He still needed to. You know, I, I gotta get my fucking legs right. If you're you kids, shut up back there. So we rode the entire way, and I see kids now, 55 pound, eight year old, whatever, malnourished little weird kid, sitting backwards in his own special chair. And I'm like, you right. lucky little fuck. I was trapped between the bed of an El Camino and my dad's ass for eight hours across Ohio. It was horrifying. But we didn't know. We were making a game of it. My sister and I. We'd get those sucky sticks at a Stuckies, like the cinnamon, th and just right. shiv each other like prisoners in the back of the El Camino. Because they couldn't reach us. No one could hit us anymore. They couldn't get back. Their arms didn't fit. So we got away with murder in there. Just on the subject of children, safety, and travel, like if you think about it, like I circled the globe in the bed of a pickup truck, like just sitting on the fender on the, in the back of a pickup truck. My dad had a 63 VW Bug. The seats, the, the thing that was great about a, a VW Bug, forget about the headrest, there was no headrest, lap belt, whatever. The seats just flopped forward. They didn't even like, somebody in Stuttgart in like 1962 was like, Hans, should we put a latch? So, no, it's too expensive, it weighs too much. No, just let the, let the seat flap forward. We didn't have any money. We couldn't go to Knott's Berry Farm or Disneyland, but this thing had like a rag top. It wasn't a convertible. It had that big like weird canvas thing, kind of sunroof. You would pull it and slide it back. And for fun, we would just stand on the passenger seat and hang out of the thing, you know, like king of the world, like Leonardo DiCaprio hanging out of this VW bug. Like I've, I've went, We'd go motorcycle riding with my friend Chris. He'd load up the back of the Chevy Silverado, and we'd just ride in between the motorcycles all the way out to Aquadose Canyon in the bed of a truck. Like, there were no rules, right? We're alive. How we're alive. We alive? I don't I get know. it. I know. I know. It'd be so awesome for the audience if I never made it out of that <laughs> truck right now. It'd be confusing, but awesome. All right, uh, Max Zapata, we're going to bring on uh, Gina and Brian and do some, uh, some blah, blah, blah. Let's do it. Let me, uh, let me hit uh, Life Lock here before, uh, before we, we heat up Brian and Gina and play a little blah, blah, blah. Ah, that's right. Wow, Life Lock. You guys want to protect yourself. You want to get Life Lock. Identity theft, man. Come on. You need to protect yourself. It's... Uh, uh, there's all these scams out here. What I've figured out with uh, folks, what I've figured out about criminals is they're lazy cowards who would rather just sit home and hack into your account and steal all your information and hammer the checks that way than bust into your house and get hit with rock salt in the ass or bit by a Labrador. Let's make it a German Shepherd. I gotta laugh, they're not biting anybody. It's important to understand how cybercrime and identity theft are affecting our lives every day. We put our information out on the internet. You could miss certain threats if you're just monitoring your credit alone. Good thing there's LifeLock. Protect yourself with LifeLock, right Dawson? 
No, 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 you look good, Gina. What's going on? God bless you. I got a new top that I thought I would premiere here on the show. Nice. And I, I as my mom said, um, stop looking like you ra uh, combed your hair with a candy apple. So I, I cur colored it for you. What happened to criticizing kids? <laughs> Didn't stop in the grad house. I, I know. Like uh, my, it, it was just a general thing. Like my mom. So I was a kid, I was the same way I am now. I'm like, oh, here's a thought, here's an idea, here's a thought. And every once in a blue moon, I'd go like, oh, oh, mom, mom, I can't remember what I want to say. I, I can't remember what I was going to say. And she'd just go, must not have been very important. <laughs> yep. Like, thanks, cunt. <laughs> By the way, every time you said to me, must not have been very important, that equals another nine months of me digging ditches on a construction site. Thank you. But, uh, and uh, so you guys ready to play a little uh, blah, blah, blog? I've never oh, man, been more do ready. Let's do it. Now, John, you know the rules to blah, blah, blog? I can figure it out. It doesn't sound hard. That's good. Well, Chris <laughs> has to know. <laughs> it's time for blah, blah, blog. The game where we match the celebrity with their retarded online rant. Let's play. All right, so earlier this week, celebrities announced that they would not post on Facebook or Instagram for one day in an effort to hashtag stop hate for profit. These are some of their posts, encouraging their fans to do the same. Lies spread wider and faster than the truth, but Facebook makes too much money to stop misinformation designed to keep us separated and enraged because that gets clicks and clicks make money. Trump won't regulate them because this chaos behooves him and his masters. Dark times, but darkness can't exist in the light. Let's shed some light on this shit by demanding Facebook stop hate for profit. <laughs> Is it Sarah Silverman? Alyssa Milano? or Amy Schumer. Oh. Mm. My thing, like I'd like to talk to Facebook, like, like hey, Facebook, <laughs> I demand you stop hate. And also, what's up with gravity? <laughs> <laughs> Fucking had a hard time getting off the sofa. She fixed that shit. Misinformation, how come there wasn't a, a Sandra Bullock movie from the 90s called yeah. Misinformation? Like, <laughs> I she, think Kate Hudson she, must have pitched that. She worked for the phone company. She was, a, she was a widow, and all of a sudden, she had to solve crime. It's good. It's not too late for that. It's I would, not. I'd still watch that. It's not. All right, all right. Uh, now, this can't be Sarah Silverman, I don't right? Think so. She's too no. smart for that shit, right? Until the choices came up, I was thinking Ruth Bader Ginsburg, but it may be too uh, soon for that. Too that, soon. That, uh, too soon. That was cheap, I admit it. I'm just going topical, over topical. All right. It, now, it, it drives me nuts because, like, I always, I, I have this thing with comedians where, like, they should be funny or interesting yeah. or smart or something, but this could be Amy Schumer, right? Like, I hate it when comedians go down this road. Like, I, I don't mind uh, vitriolic. I just want a little twist at the end, not just crazy and angry. I, I'm gonna go Alyssa Milano. It's low-hanging fruit. Yeah. It's low-hanging fruit. I, I, you know, it's that moment when uh, like, uh, like musicians and comedians find like sobriety. 
and mm. the last 10 minutes of their act is like to tell you, ham-handedly tell you everything they believe. Really. Yeah, yeah, I So I'm that. kind of yeah. thinking Amy Schumer after the pregnancy and everything. Yeah, so I'm going to lean know. towards that right now. She's well, got... To be fair to Amy Schumer, she is the only female on the planet to ever fucking get pregnant. (laughs) (laughs) Bitch, we get it, you're pregnant. My mom's the worst person in the world. She was pregnant twice. Move on. Maybe three times. Who the fuck knows what she was up to? (laughs) Three times, fool. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. All right, so you're going with, are you going with Amy Schumer? I'll go Schumer on this. Brian, what do you think? Total shot in the dark. I have no idea. I'm going to go Silverman off the board. Oh, boy. I pray it's not. Gina? (laughs) I I think at first, the whole time he was reading it, I thought it was a dude. So that would lead me towards Amy or Sarah. But you're right. There was nothing like super duper clever about it, as is Sarah's kind of signature thing. I'm going Amy Schumer. The blog belongs to... Sarah Silverman. Oh, come on. I knew it. Oh, Sarah, oh, come boy. On. What happened no. to the comedy? It's a travesty. It's a travesty. Yeah. Mm. Tough stuff. All right. Wait, who, 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 was the audience rooting for, like, uh, Alyssa Milano to, like, just to fucking hate her a little more? By the way, I don't know, I brought up uh, misinformation, but I also said low-hanging fruit. That would have been a good 90s. Yeah. Like, Jim Bullock is. <laughs> <laughs> I think Sandra Bullock also could have played that right. for some reason. They could have gotten together. All right, here we go, Dawson. These tools were not built to spread hate, violence, and misinformation. But when companies and individuals benefit from these behaviors, financially or otherwise, it becomes their responsibility to mitigate the unintended utilization. Is it Ashton Kutcher, Mark Ruffalo, or Orlando Bloom? Mm. Oh boy. I'm leaning, I'm definitely leaning. This is a murderous row of (laughs) douche. This is a tsunami of douche. It's the supermarket aisle. Ashton Kutcher is like, his whole thing is like, I know I'm hot, but I'm going to spend every waking hour dissuading you for thinking about me being hot and just do everything like, you know, tell me how you got in on the ground floor of Uber. Tell me me how you, you fund all these startup companies and now you're some sort of champion for civil rights. Uh, Ruffalo... You know, it's, you know, it's weird, like celebrities, like you think about celebrities from like the 30s and the 40s and the 50s, like back in the day, if you were a celebrity, if you were a celebrity in the 40s, you're like, I'm gonna get a Duesenberg, I'm gonna fuck underage chicks and I'm gonna drive drunk everywhere. And <laughs> I'll never get a ticket. And, and that's, and I'll smoke in, in every airport. Like, that's what celebrities did. It was awesome being a celebrity. And now fucking Mark Ruffalo's like, oh, I got to just wring my hands and worry about the fate of humanity and put these fucking sullen, earnest tweets out there all the time. This can't be Kutcher. Can it be Kutcher? No. Orlando Bloom. Orlando Bloom, I was watching TM, this can't be Orlando Bloom because I was watching TMZ. By the way, he just had a kid. You know what he named his kid? Uh, it's Katy Perry's kid too, right? Katy yeah, Perry, yeah. yeah. What did they no, name? he named his kid Daisy, which is a smart move. Daisy Bloom, oh, right? Oh, wow. Good. I mean, he could have went with Judy, but he went with Daisy. <laughs> <laughs> Lily? <laughs> the point is, is I saw pictures of him he had a custom 50s pickup truck, much like your dad's yeah. uh, late <laughs> okay. 60s. El- Did he have a 454 in that El the Camino? Big engine, that's why we took big it across Big block Ohio. El Camino, yeah. badass cowl induction. I don't know. Your I dad, was, I was four. Your dad must have smoked like three cigarettes at a time, well, My mom though, right? smoked a pack and my dad bitched about it. He secondhand smoked like two packs a day. Oh, really? Mom, so, okay, yeah. good. Because anyone, they won't sell you an El Camino unless you're smoking. <laughs> like, if you go to 
like a used car lot in 1974 and like, I want a 454 El Camino with the cowl induction. They'd be like, where are your cigarettes? <laughs> You're like, excuse me, you want my license? No, no, cigarettes, cigarettes. We can't sell these things. Rules are rules. So Orlando Bloom had a custom pickup truck. It was on TMZ a couple of days ago, and he's down in Malibu, and he's got these uh, wakeboard hydrofoil things. Have you seen the things? They have the fin on them, and they're electric, and you ride up above the waves. Yes, that's him. That's him. He's riding on this. It's riding on this thing, and I thought this is a happy guy. This guy's out enjoying nature, and also this guy. This guy. I like this guy's attitude because he's like, I want to go in the ocean, but I don't want to deal with the waves. <laughs> And someone's like, well, that's kind of one of the things you get when you go to the ocean. He's like, I'd like to be eight to 10 inches above the waves. And someone's like, how's that gonna work, Orlando? And he's like, well, what if I got a Ziffy board and I put a motor on it and we put a keel in it and I just rode above the surface of the water? Like, what if Jesus Christ was alive today? <laughs> How do you think he would have gotten around? Do you think he would have simply walked on water? Why? Or would he take a sea dew? <laughs> so I gotta believe Jesus eventually would have to hop a sea dew or Orlando Bloom's electric ziffy board. This is a man of action. Yeah. This is a man who embraces life. This is not a miserable fuck who writes these no. soliloquies out there. I'm taking Orlando yeah. Bloom off this list. Oh. You can't, you can't own that thing and be like worried about civilization. You don't give a fuck if you're like, the ocean's too, I'm going no. above that shit. I'm gonna right. ride above it, I'm better than that. Yeah, this thing is a, a person who's just enjoying it. I don't day. care how many dolphins I nick. <laughs> I am riding this fucking thing. <laughs> so, <clears throat> or, Orlando. Look at that. Uh, yeah, the dude is, no. He's chugging a fucking can of beer. He's got his electric ziffy board. Max Zapata, is there, I swear to God, a, a, a day ago on TMZ, it was Orlando Bloom with Katy Perry's dad, who's a preacher. Have you guys seen Katy Perry's dad? Oh no. my God. No. Katy Katie, Perry's dad. <laughs> Katy Perry's dad is like some kind of minister where the whole thing about the man who uh, the men who share the good news about uh, Jesus Christ they're either wearing a suit with nothing else or they have tons of fucking jewelry and like a bad weave you know what i mean like i don't know why there's no intermediate preachers out there but katy perry's dad is some kind of preacher and he's festooned with uh, <laughs> medallions and necklaces and brooches and shit like that and there's a picture of Orlando Bloom and Katy Perry's dad. He's got this slammed custom 50s pickup truck and he has two of these electric hydro boards hanging out of it. Anyway, this guy, he's not a guy who's bitching about Facebook. No. I've taken no. him off the list. So who else do we have, Dawson? Sorry. If Ashton, Ashton Kutcher. Kutcher. Yes. And Mark Ruffalo. Uh, Mark and Ruffalo. Orlando Bloom. Yeah, Mark Ruffalo is so easy yeah. on this and one. And actually, the quote wasn't douchey enough for Ruffalo. Like, Ruffalo's always, like, it's that weird, you know, I just think the world has to, we're right. all so independent. Like, shut the fuck up. You're whispering. You're the Hulk, for Christ's sake. Right. Have a fucking force behind your voice. And he's always crying. And right. I think because it didn't make any sense at all, and it was just a lot of big words, like when your friends in college get drunk and try to solve every problem. Right. It reminds me of a Kutcher thing. I'm leaning Kutcher on this. I'm going with John. I'm going Kutcher on this yeah. one, too. Brian? Sometimes uh, a portion of these jump out at you, like when in this one it said something to the effect of, oh, when, when corporations like this benefit, benefit financially or otherwise, how else would a corporation benefit? <laughs> like street cred for having hate on their site. This is a stupid tweet. I'm going to go with Kutcher. Mm. Uh, he's an angel investor. I think he'd like to keep corporate America on the happy side. So I'm going to get off the Kutcher train and jump on to the Ruffalo Express. It's going to be right. Bloom. It's going to be Bloom. Brian, who'd you, go, who'd you go Kutcher. with, Brian? Ashton Kutcher. Okay, so we've got three Kutcher. 
one Ruffalo. It's a zero, fucking bloom. I'm zero, calling it. It'd be I'm awesome if no, no, it's Orlando all Bloom. All aboard the Kutcher train. The blog belongs to Ashton Kutcher. Oh, all right. oh yeah. 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 It was the drunk uncle thing. It's like the independence yeah, of the uh, okay. corporations in the. We all won't right. tolerate it. Orlando oh Bloom <laughs> is with his father in law, who's Katy Perry's preacher dad, who's wearing a lot of silver. Is that I think Robert he's, Conrad? I is think he's father with father Robert S Conrad? <laughs> <laughs> I think he's with Wild Sloth West from Seven. For treatment. <laughs> Brian, what do you think? I think he's with Sloth from Seven. <laughs> yeah. He looks like his hashtag would be Leather Daddy for the Lord. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, he's got a leather vest on and a short sleeve shirt and a lot of silver swinging from his neck. And then there's another picture of the of the custom pickup truck with the Ziffy board in the back. So uh, the good news is everyone hates their father-in-law, <laughs> and it makes it, it makes me uh, it makes me happy. Everyone. All right. Uh, what else we got, Dawson? We are 46 days from the election, and the fact remains that dollars are being spent on the promotion of hatred, white supremacy, and lies when it comes to our democracy. Kenosha was a terrorist attack that started from a Facebook group which was promoted by the platform. Do your research. Not everything you read on the internet is true. Not everything is false either, but it's important that we make sure we're sharing, promoting, and spreading the truth and joy and love <laughs> sending you love always xoxo <laughs> hold on can i say this how much joy and love is the internet responsible for <laughs> right. w with your cock in your pants i'm saying i'm not talking about the <laughs> love like you born i'm saying like you want a little uh. joy how about you fucking go outside and build a goddamn treehouse? What are you finding? Why are you on the internet looking for joy and love and truth? How about you fucking get a wiffle ball and hit it to your special needs son? Why, why are we, who thinks it's regular baseball, by the way? Don't say anything. Don't tell him. Don't tell him. Sorry, who is this going to be, Dawson? Is it Lenny Kravitz? Oh, Lenny. Oh, no. Kerry Washington. Or John Boyega. I can't believe there's any male choices. Wow. That's surprising. Lenny Kravitz, like, what if Lenny Kravitz looked like, uh, I don't know, Lenny Dykstra? Like, let's just say. <laughs> Cause like Lenny Kravitz is like, let me take my shirt off and play American woman on a Stratocaster. And then everyone goes, we're all ears, Lenny. Like, what do you got? But when you're doughy and white and dumpy and fat and you have orthodontia problems and you start preaching about this shit, everyone's like, shut up, fatty. I've heard enough out of you. I have so much guilt with Kerry Washington because of the movie Last King of Scotland mm. that I actually masturbated to the scene after she'd been quartered and laid out naked on the, uh, I can admit that, we're friends, right? <laughs> it was horrible. Horrible moment, but I'm like, when am I going to see her naked again? Who knew? She did two more nude scenes. I had some guilt to live with for a while. I met Kerry Washington uh, backstage at a, at a David Mamet play in, uh, in New York that uh, David Allen Greer was in. And that was she, the best Mad Lib sentence ever, by the way. Yes, I know. <laughs> she... She she was one of in the in the in the David Mamet play race, which uh, she was in. Um, I met her after the show, like backstage, and she was like, I don't know, no one had heard of her. This is right. God, probably 15 years ago or whatever. She was uh, sweet. I saw her a couple of months ago at uh, one of those, uh, you, know, you, you know when they did the uh, live uh, All in the Family and the yeah. live Jeffersons, she was at a party over there as well. She's uh, nice to me, becomes sort of an activist. I don't know, who's the last fella? It's Star Wars, the most recent Star He's Wars. He's a Star yeah. Wars guy? That's mm -hmm. Okay, I've never, I haven't seen uh, a Star Wars since uh, he's 1977. Super active now. Yeah, like so he's, he's happy. I don't know. Uh, 
Gina, why don't you go first on this one? Oof. Uh, all right. Well, let's see. The XOXO leads me toward Lenny. But um, I, I, I feel like mm, Carrie might be I, – yeah, I think it's a very male thing to be like, do your research. No offense, guys. Um, so I'm going to stay with the dudes. I don't know enough about Boyega. Love and light and love was the end of it. I'm going Lenny. You go Kravitz. Yeah. Brian, where's Brian? Is he up I'm there? right here. Okay, Excuse Brian, me. what do you like? Who do you like? When I heard this being read, I thought old, out of touch person because I don't. There's no way Facebook was promoting this hate group, and I think it represents a fundamental misunderstanding of how Facebook works. So when Lenny first came up, I was like, no. But now I'm like, it's fucking Lenny Kravitz. So I'm going. He's the oldest. Kravitz. Yeah. John, what do you think? Uh, the XOXO thing made me think that it was somebody trying to make up for being too. Like, and, right. I, and that would make me lead off. And Kerry Washington would kind of be like the feminine touch at the end there. Mm -hmm. uh, so Lenny Kravitz ruined my uh, bachelor party <laughs> because we uh, we went to Lake Tahoe, I think, for my bachelor party, and we for, on Saturday we uh, rented a boat, and like the skipper took us out. And the only CD he had on this boat, it was like me and Jimmy and Jeff Ross and a bunch of those guys, you know, and we're like, we're going to have some fun out on the boat, jump in the water, blah, blah, blah. And uh, the only CD he had was the best of Lenny Kravitz, <laughs> which angered me. And then Everybody. it angered everyone on the ship. Even the first mate was upset. Even the fish. And... I became obsessed because I, I'm, I'm obsessed with narcissism. And I know Lenny Kravitz is a massive narcissist. And I got the best of Lenny Kravitz CD and I pulled out the jacket that had the liner notes and all the pictures and stuff in it. And I just kept going through it. And there's all these little pictures of like Lenny Kravitz live and him with his cats and him with his mom and blah, blah, blah. And I counted 56 pictures of Lenny Kravitz in this. This is a CD. This is a jewel case that's four by four. There were 56. And of course, I was drunk on this boat. And I went up to everyone. I was like, guess how many pictures of Lenny fucking Kravitz are in this goddamn CD? You tell me. You guess. And they're like, how about we smoke a joint and jump in the lake? And I was like, no, not till you guess how many goddamn pictures of Lenny fucking Kravitz are on that CD that they won't stop playing. So he essentially ruined my bachelor party and, and my marriage, really. And for that, I'm gonna say Lenny Kravitz. Log belongs to Kerry Washington. Oh! Damn it. Wait a minute, you're Damn. mad that I got it? What the hell? <laughs> Or what's, this, what's the score here, Dawson? Let's do one more. I got nothing. Ace, you have one. Bald Brian and John are tied at two. And Gina Grad is off the board. All right. Well, Gina, you're out. Let's just do the next one to get one right wins. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. That's, that's fair. <laughs> that's not how we wrap word. it up. John, this is pretty normal around here. I, I, that's, uh, that's how I run my show. I, I don't like this anymore. This is what I do. This is how you play basketball when you're losing. Like, you're up 28-9. All right, next basket wins. Let's do this. <laughs> this is the pullout method Zuckerberg doesn't want you to use. Facebook ignores hate and disinformation, putting profits over people and democracy. How long can they ignore it if their advertisers pull out? Is it Trevor Noah, Chelsea Handler, or Tom Arnold? Ooh. Oh. Good luck to you all. I don't know. Is it crazy enough for Tom Arnold? <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't mention AA once, so I'm going to say right. Tom Arnold's out. <laughs> what happened to goddamn comedy over here? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Let's just, uh, let, let's say this will be between uh, John and Brian at 2-2. Uh, two, two. Well, uh, you guys, you guys pick one. It's possible that there's a third. Yeah. I, this feels like Chelsea to me. That's all. Usually there's a C-bomb in a Chelsea tweet that's mad. 
know, that's John, true. I, I, yeah. And she someone who does want... show her tits a lot. She, yeah, well, that plus that. Uh, if only she was quartered, I could do something with that. The, uh, <laughs> it seemed like well thought out. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that Tom Arnold has the capabilities. I'm no, going to go with Trevor Noah on that one. I like, I like Trevor Noah here. Trevor Noah. Yeah. Brian? Now, my hunch, is this, is, this is not clever enough for Trevor Noah. I'm going Chelsea Handler. Mm. Oh, all right, <clears throat> this is it. For the win. For blowjobs. <laughs> the blog belongs to Chelsea Handler. Yeah. Congratulations, Paul Brian. Brian. Congratulations. You're right. It was a lot of pull-out talk and yeah. uh, not ah, smart true. enough for uh, Trevor and Noah. That's true. All right. We have an outro. Until next time, keep your fingers on your keyboards and your heads up your asses so we can play another round of Blah, Blah, Blah. Oh, there's the picture. All right, so Orlando Bloom is in his custom 50s pickup truck, and in the back of his pickup truck are these sort of electric wave. You can kind of see it. It's a little blurry, but it's a hydrofoil with an electric motor and a propeller on the back of it. <laughs> I wonder if Orlando Bloom is just going up and down PCH with this shit, with this blade hanging out the back, and all the Mexican gardeners are like, Ese, that guy's on top of the world, dude. <laughs> that guy is the best weed whacker and the coolest pickup truck. That There's was my no Mexican gardener. In the back, man. You're supposed to build up the sides and cover <laughs> up your shit. I love that they blanked out the license plate because without that, we have no idea who's driving this car. Now yeah. that we all know he drives yeah. the Smucker's truck from the commercial. Yeah. Is that Orlando Bloom in his uh, slammed custom teal pickup truck <laughs> with the hydrofoils hanging out the back? I don't know. Let me check the license plate. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Should we do a little uh, news, Gina Grad? Do it. Let's do it. News with Grad. News with Gina Grad. Break. Viral, all those crazy Trump tweets. Give me news with Gina Grad. Trouble in the Middle East. Celebrity drunk meltdown. Seek news with Gina Gina Grad. The news with Gina Grad. Brought to you by Bet Online. So you mentioned the Emmys, Adam, and something that we hadn't talked about were the Emmys hazmat suits. Because according to TMZ, presenters will be wearing complete hazmat suits to hand out awards as safely as possible. But not just any hazmat suit, a fancy a tuxedo, tuxedo <laughs> hazmat suit. Really? Uh, yeah, with the social distancing and all, producers say there will be some in-person interaction, which creates the need for the Emmy-branded hazmat suit. And this is um, created and designed by uh, someone named Katja Cahill, famous costume designer who usually dresses Academy Awards presenters now does the uh, waving inflatable guy at the uh, used car dealership. Mm. You know, first off, what the fuck is going on in this world? <laughs> I, I just got off a fucking crowded Southwest flight. Most of the people were wearing their masks like a sack hammock, like it was stretched out and down around their nutsack. Like what? Are celebrities... Are they, are, are, are they like an endangered species? Are they have a lowered immune system? They have problems with their T-cell counts? Like, are they like John Travolta in that Boy in the Plastic Bubble movie? Like, what's, what's going on? Like, what, what? I like the idea that the red carpet would be like, who are you wearing? Oh, tonight I'm wearing formal Walter White. Uh, That's looking right. Pretty... I'm wearing hefty. Yeah. By the way, Glad. <laughs> They're all wearing the outfit that college wrestlers wear wear before they weigh in. Like, like they're literally, they're literally, they're literally sweating off the pounds before they go on. But you know, what? this would be good if there was a red carpet. Like, if you put on the full hefty bag uh, tuxedo. And and by the way, if there was ever a time to wear fur, uh, now is the time. Because when one of those PETA assholes threw the paintballs at you, you'd go, how do you like me now, bitch? I'm wearing a fucking garbage bag. It's a long way to go for a joke. I, I, I do... I do admit that. 
So there was, I, I literally, I had an email with Jimmy and uh, before, like in the airport, and you know, you know the best. I'll tell you the best. If you've done a few award shows, like I've done, uh, I've been with uh, Jimmy for the uh, Emmys and a uh, couple of Oscars and all this kind of shit, and I, I know how it goes. And so, the Friday before the Emmys or before the Oscars or whatever, it's just total clusterfuck crunch time. Like that's where you're getting, you're sifting through all the jokes and it's just like you're trying to get everything together. And it's, it's such a pressure cooker at this, at this point. I remember, I think Jimmy was hosting, did he host like the, I don't know, the block, I think I hosted like the Blockbuster Music Awards or something like that, or the Blockbuster Video Awards or something in like a former life. But I think Jimmy did one of those music award shows and it was like Dick Clark had put the thing on and it was Dick Clark as he was getting into his waning years, you know? And I knew Dick Clark had like lost a step because we had this, weird little uh, sort of corral set up like right by the stage. So the way these award shows works is, or used to work, if somebody came up and like Kanye West, you know, jumped up on stage and grabbed Taylor Swift's Grammy or something like that, as the host, you'd have to say something. You'd have to have a joke when you went back out there. And obviously you wouldn't anticipate that. So there was this weird little room with like the black duvetine. They made a little corral back there and you, the joke writers would be like, oh shit, this just happened with the acceptance speech. Like, here's a joke. Like, why don't you say this? Like, here's to be writing jokes feverishly. And Jimmy was out of this little corral and I was sitting in there writing jokes and uh, Dick Clark threw the curtain open and he looked at me and he went, Jimmy, get back out there. And I was like, all right, but I'm dropping in, Bob's. And I'm like, and I realized, I think Dick had lost a step at that point because he pointed at me to go back out on stage. So, uh, sorry, Gina, where were we? Well, we, let's stick with celebrities for a second because uh, a $6 crown has made some history. The Notorious B.I.G.'s famed King of New York crown got sold at auction for a lot more than it was purchased for, which was $6. The headpiece Biggie wore in his iconic final photo shoot in 1997 uh, just got sold off in a Sotheby's auction. And I know you're, uh, you and TMZ are uh, married, Adam, so you probably already know the number, but would anyone like to guess what it sold for? This is a plastic $6 crown that was purchased off the street before the photo shoot. Did the painting of one of the angry pigs come with it? I'm not sure <laughs> that that's a good flattering photo of Biggie. Well, I'll Look, tell you. Right. It, it looks the, a little bit like it. You all thought so. I'll tell you that the uh, the photo almost didn't happen because Diddy didn't like it because he said it made him look like Burger King. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, uh, what did it sell I, for? It's not the same crown. I, I was wish somebody well, it looks had very shot different. to Burger King in 1998, like <laughs> or whatever he was shot. Um, this I I did not see this on TMZ. Oh. No, uh, I don't know uh, what what happened. I watched the show religiously, so I'm shocked. I, I did not see this. Um, somebody just shouted out eighty grand, so I'm going with eighty grand. What do you guys think? I was thinking a little lower, fifty, fifty k. Fifty. I have to bow out. I actually know. What's okay. that? Okay. I actually know. You're oh, recusing you yourself. Okay. Yeah. That was a dignified <laughs> thing to do. Yeah. You guys are so low on this. It ended up going for $594,000. Oh, and seven hundred fifty, dollars So almost $600,000 for that thing. Wow. No goddamn uh, idea it would be <laughs> worth that much. But The you economy know, is icon. fine. Everybody can be quiet. We have plenty <laughs> of money. <laughs> Did they ever figure out who shot him or was it like some LAPD guy? <laughs> There was some sort of weird story, right? There was a whole the conspiracy, yeah. right? Yeah, they don't know any of, like, the, they haven't solved any mysteries he of got, him or Tupac. You guys, uh, he was shot at the uh, Peterson Automotive Museum. 
I remember, like, I'm a car guy, so I remember hearing that. I was like, they're like, Biggie Smalls is dead. I was like, are the cars okay? <laughs> There's a guy who's not that into rap. I was into vintage cars. Of course, I had my concerns, you know. Sure. So John's dad's yeah. El Camino, was it, was it hit? <laughs> Were the kids in it? <laughs> but um, anyone who knows Los Angeles, that is smack dab in the middle of the Miracle Mile and Wilshire Boulevard. Like, there's not a good way to escape. How do you get away? Yeah, I know. We're, I mean, you could get to the 10 freeway. It would take you a little bit, take you a little bit of time. Like, it, it seems like a very catchable place to commit a crime. Right. It is not, you know, the desert outside of Vegas, 1957. <laughs> you know, this is right in the middle of Los Angeles. Now, if that crime happened today, there'd be a, tons of video footage, right? All the surveillance stuff, yeah. ring doorbell cameras, blah, blah, blah. Like, we would see the assailant, the car. We never did solve that one, right? No, and I've listened to multiple podcasts, and the big reveal at the end is these podcasts don't go anywhere. So I think that we are, uh, we are still uh, up in the air about that one. And Tupac, don't forget. I, I used to get suckered into that stuff, too, like the ones... Like, you know going in that they never solved the crime, right. but you still listen to the whole thing. Like, I used to, when I was a kid, it'd be like, hi, I'm Leonard Nimoy, <laughs> the Loch Ness Monster. <laughs> True or false? Tonight, we blow the lid off the cover of the Loch Ness Monster. And I'd be like, okay, good, finally. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to see the Loch Ness Monster. And then, like, if they'd get to the end, it'd be like, hi, I'm Leonard Nimoy. <laughs> You decide what's real. And what's like, what? I decide. I just invested 56 minutes of my fucking life into this fiasco. Now I got to decide? Did you it's see the story that there were seven people still this year that have seen the Loch Ness Monster? They're keep, like, we don't have the technology now to have gone through that lake over the last 1,500 right. years to go down and go, it's not real. We but don't seven have people have still reported it. Yeah. It's imagine? driftwood. The Loch Ness Monster was probably 65% of my childhood. Like, I mean, is there or isn't there? We have a grainy black and white footage of a, is that doctor? But could you imagine me trying to get my 14-year-old kids into the Loch Ness Monster? <laughs> like, hey, there's this body of water in Europe, and there's this thing that may be a dinosaur that could live in it. They'd be like, fuck off, old man. <laughs> I'm playing Fortnite. Look at the camera phones in Scotland yet. They can get something better than a 1950s grainy shot. There's literally the one shot from 1957 of the Loch Ness Monster. There is no... Chris, is there an updated shot of the Loch Ness Monster? I don't... Uh, have you Adam, seen no! Yeah, yeah, the answer no. is no. No, and there's... Uh, I mean, all we had was Bigfoot the Loch Ness Monster, and then there was like this thing of like, you know, did, were the pyramids built by aliens? aliens. For that one. And right. then they would show like a painting from the day, but it was a <laughs> stick figure and the head was round. It's like, could this have been a helmet? It's like, I, it could have been a helmet or maybe the guy who drew it was fucking high. We'll never know, Leonard Nimoy. <laughs> you decide. Whatever, whatever happened to the abominable snowman? Mm. That's real. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that picture that you've seen, is for, it's from 1934, and it's a hoax. Oh, it's a hoax? Yeah. You don't say. What? <laughs> it's yeah. a hoax? That one from Explain 1934. Explain yourself. I know, look, it, it, for the, many years, it was believed to be real. The Loch Ness but, Monster is gone. The Loch Ness Monster didn't have a second name. The Abominable Snowman had yeah. Yeti. Yeti. Right? Yeah. And then Big Big Bigfoot, Bigfoot Sasquatch. and Sasquatch. Sasquatch. Right, yeah. right. And do, do you know there are people that are that are alive now, like present day adults that go squatching? No. I they like know. they'll take a long <laughs> weekend. <laughs> no, squatching, that's when you shit in the woods. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> no, that's don't get that confused with splotching, which is when you sit in like a tub of pudding naked and men pay you. I wouldn't know. Um <laughs> You can take a long weekend off, like, you know, from your job in the Pacific Northwest and go squatching, which is to look for Sasquatch. So that's still currently happening. I wish I knew how to quit you. <laughs> I, uh, I remember, I do remember 
very clearly when the six million dollar man had to fight Bigfoot. Like that was, that was appointment viewing when you had only three TV channels and no fucking life whatsoever. Like Lee Majors is gonna fight a slightly bigger dude with a wig on. This is gonna be awesome. Yes. Has anything aged worse than the $6 million man? That, that's a knee replacement in like a three-day hospital stay. I know, the $6 million man, I know. They were, Even the, as a six-year-old, I was disappointed because you could see the zipper on the suit yes. of the thing. Like they had to shoot around it, you could see it. I was laughing with uh, Dr. Drew. I can't remember if we were talking about this, but the $6 million man crashed in experimental aircraft and it was an actual aircraft that crashed it was like an experimental delta wing whatever crashed when it was landing at edwards air force base or whatever that story is true the pilot of that experimental aircraft like lost two limbs and was burned and jacked up and everything and they made the six million dollar man now there was the six million dollar man and then they spun it off into the bionic woman who was, her deal is, is she had a parachuting accident, <laughs> and that's why, and then later on, they had the bionic dog, which what? was like a German shepherd. Her dog, the bionic woman's dog, was a German shepherd who also had all their like limbs removed. And like, I remember being 13, and someone's like, how did she get a bionic dog? And I was like, shoot, didn't open. <laughs> she actually well what else could, what else was there like i don't know she her shoot didn't open and i guess the dog shoot didn't I, open i love how they gave him the value six million dollar man and then bionic woman they didn't yeah. like even do the 72 percent last thing they didn't like do the pay gap oh they and, just said bionic woman and she has no value in 1978 there's a guy smoking going well, well i don't get what's wrong with bionic bitch why is that <laughs> right. it, it, it's, it, chet it's called alliteration bionic woman i don't think so bionic, Sign the bionic broad want to we understand yeah. <laughs> yes she got into a skydiving accident and that's why she had her her shit all all fixed up all right gina let's do let's do one more you got it. Well, I know people are imbibing, having a good time, and far be it for me not to give you all your choices. So in case you haven't heard, Taco Bell Canada is debuting a custom wine called, Brian, get ready to just puke in your shoe, Jalapeno Noir. It's not bad. It's a wine uh, for customers in select cities around Canada. It is not cheap. 25 bucks a bottle, but the reason they put it out is uh, it, they want it to go with their toasted cheesy chalupa. They say, together, the duo is irresistible. The rich taste and crunchy texture of the beloved toasty cheesy chalupa complements notes of wild strawberry, cherry, and beetroot in this silky limited edition red wine. Yeah, so here's the thing, Taco Bell. <laughs> First off, you're Taco Bell. You, for, you don't need to make dessert. Every six years, they roll out a dessert. Yeah. Like, the, what is this dessert? Uh, these are broken taco shells that we put cinnamon on. Okay, you're just trying to repurpose taco shells at this point. Like, you're trying to sell us fucking surplus taco shells. You're not allowed to do dessert. You're not allowed to do wine. That's the whole thing. Like, what, at some point, like, oh, Taco Bell, yes, we've launched a new birth control. <laughs> this is a new form of birth control. It's a tostada that you put in front of your coos that can't be penetrated. But, like, just, you fucking, you're Taco Bell. Stay in your lane. Right. Do Taco Bell. You're not allowed to do dessert. You're not allowed to do wine. And Pizza Hut, if you're listening, you don't get to do fucking dessert either. That's like, oh, we have a brownie pizza. No, that's not dessert. Oh. You can't do dessert and you can't do booze. Brian? Speaking of pizza, the, the Taco Bell fans are rip shit pissed because uh, they announced no more Mexican pizza. That's right. No Get more what? No Mexican, more Mexican pizza. pizza. Oh, really? Yep. It's racist. R.I.P. That's racist, yeah. <laughs> it's too racist. I, I didn't know. I've been ordering that for years. I had no fucking idea it was that <laughs> bad. I'm sorry. All right, Gina. Uh, do we bring it home? We'll bring it home right now. I'm Gina Grad, and that's the news. Gina, Gina. <laughs> that was the news with Gina Grad, brought to you by Bet Online, your online sportsbook experts.
All right. I'm going to uh, bid adieu to Gina and uh, Bald Brian. Thank you, guys. Bye. As per usual. Uh, John Holmberg, I'm going to bid adieu to as well. Holmberg's morning sickness weekdays, 5.30 to 10 a.m. on 98 KUPD as well. Thanks, John. Thank you, Adam. Uh, get your uh, Adam Carolla's unprepared questions ready for the last segment of the show. We'll do that in just one second. First, a quick spot. True Nigen. I don't know if you guys are on True Nigen. I am on True Nigen. I've been taking this daily supplement for uh, about six months now. Dr. Drew, no one looks better in his underpants than Dr. Drew. We both uh, feel great. NAD is a vital cellular resource that supports daily functions like eating, sleeping, and even uh, breathing, by the way, which uh, last I checked was important. As we get older, NAD levels may decline by as much as 50% due to stressors like aging, alcohol, yes, alcohol, uh, lack of exercise, sun exposures. So when the NAD levels get low, your cells have to work super hard to replenish it. And uh, all I can tell you is uh, Shannon Sharp takes uh, this uh, true Nigen, and so does Dr. Drew, and so do I. And uh, all I can tell you is uh, I, I, I would not, I actually packed it with me on this trip because I will not leave the house without it. So uh, what you do is you visit T-R-U-N-I-A-G-E-N.com today. Use the code, Adam, and do it at checkout to 20 bucks off any three-month plus order through uh, October First, a true Nigen. All right, who's got a question? Yes, right there. College. Okay. I, uh, I've never been prouder to tell people I didn't go to college. I used to, it, it used to be like a dirty little secret, you know, like a, like doing time with having a rap sheet, you know, getting a shitty score on your SATs, going to a shitty junior college or whatever it was. It was something that I felt uh, ashamed of. Like I didn't go to college and all you other people went to college. I was hanging out the other day. I was sitting, I, I, was do I did a thing with uh, Dennis Prager, Ben Shapiro and Dave Rubin. <laughs> Nobody has more education than Ben Shapiro, Dave Rubin, and Dennis Prager. Nobody. Nobody. And they're all talking about how fucked up college has become. And, and, and I looked at all these three guys and I went, I never went to college. And they're like, oh, can we suck your dick? You're a hero. I never felt like a bigger hero because I didn't do something or go somewhere. But this is uh, the sad, sad truth about college is it's now something to aspire to, which is not going to college. Like it used to be like, this is the first, he's the first kid in our family to go to college. And now my son's gonna be like the first kid in our family to fuck college and get a goddamn job and fight to keep it. So. Also, what are you learning in college these days that isn't on your phone? Bullshit. All you're fucking learning is to hate your parents and hate America and hate the system and how, you know, we we're built on the on everything was built in this country on white supremacy and slavery and how you fucking should hate your neighbors and hate everyone who has more than ten dollars and everyone and by the way. This thing where it's like uh, anyone who is your boss, anyone who's your superior, anyone who has a corner office, they only got that way because of their white privilege or their whatever the fuck privilege or their the patriarchy or whatever it is. It's just become some sort of mill to make people pissed off and angry at the world. And then we unleash these douchebags and expect them to work. Fuck that. I, w I, I would rather, I would, I would much rather everyone here do what uh, Israel does, which is I think two years in the service. Like you get out, you get out of high school, you do two years in the service, you learn how to do a little uh, Krav Magra. 
There's also a version of it where you wear a cowboy hat called Tim McGraw. <laughs> Stupid joke. <laughs> Dumb joke. The point is, it'll never be told again, so don't worry about it. The, the point is, is you get out of high school, you fucking learn to do something, and then if you want to go to college, fine. But I would suggest, in this day and age, uh, just learn a business, learn a trade, get your information. I've never, I used to hire people, when we used to do the man show, we would hire people all the time and they would always come in with their resume, with their college, like what college they went to. We never gave a shit what college they went to. We always just were like, are you funny or are you good at softball? Those were the two, that, the, the, the main criteria for hiring was, are you funny or are you a good shortstop? Because we play a game at the end of every season and I need to pick some ringers on my team this year. The, the one guy I hired, I've told you guys this story before, but it always makes me laugh. I never knew what college anybody went to. One guy came in, his name was Adam De La Pena, and he came in and he was wearing a crazy Hawaiian shirt. And me and Jimmy said, uh, we're thinking about hiring, hiring you as a writer, but uh, what's the story with the shirt? And he goes, I made it myself. And we went, what? You made your own Hawaiian shirt? And he goes, I sewed it myself. And we went, really? And he went, you hire me. I'll sew you two a shirt, too. <laughs> and we're like, you are hired. <laughs> so all the fucking college was just uh, money thrown in a fucking hamper and set on fire. All right, other questions, yes. What's that? Drywall. Drywall. Oh, this is gonna be good. <laughs> are we talking half inch or five eighths? We, half inch, all right, you wanna talk green board or just straight drywall? Green, green board, all right. Now, you, oh, that purple board too, all right. I, uh, I used to hang drywall. Drywall hanging sucks. Moving drywall is the worst thing ever. You know what I was saying the other day? I, so when I, when I used to work construction, what would happen is they would drop off like six pallets of drywall right in the front of the house. And then someone would go, the worst Wednesday I ever had in my life is when I was 19, I was making seven bucks an hour, and there were like, there was a stack of drywall five feet high, and it was just right in front of the house. And my foreman came up to me and he's like, hey, I need 31 pieces in the master bedroom upstairs. I need 29 pieces in the living room. I need 14 pieces in the kid's room and 14 in the other kid's room and 26 pieces downstairs in the basement. And I just spent the entire fucking day trying to destroy my back, picking up two pieces at a time. Has anyone carried drywall? It's four foot by eight foot. You have one fucking hand on the ground, the other's above your head, and you're just carrying this thing, and that's all I did was wrench my back and try to carry two at a time and drag it upstairs and everything. Now I see people moving drywall. They have this little cart. It has two wheels on it. It has a little slot in the middle of it. It's probably 28 bucks. They just put this thing with two fucking skateboard wheels or shopping cart wheels on it. It's got a little slot. They put four pieces and they just da 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 da. La 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 la. I'm just moving drywall anywhere I want. My back's fine. No problemo. And I was like, why didn't we have this fucking thing? By the way, this could have been invented by the Romans. It really could have. <laughs> I fucking wrenched my back in 1989 carrying this fucking shit all over the place. This thing, which the invention was essentially wheels put on a slot that made it easy to move plywood and drywall and everything that was four by eight didn't, wasn't invented until 2004. It's the same thing, like I didn't get, what's the deal with wheels? We had wheels. Every one of us drove a truck there. We didn't drive a truck there on fucking tracks. We had wheels. Why didn't somebody think about this? It's the, the answer is no one gave a shit about people back then. My foreman would see me carrying this drywall upstairs with my back dragging on the ground. He'd go, look at that fucker. I hope he never walks right again. 
the fucking wheels on the trash can. It took 57 years to put wheels on trash cans. When I was a kid, we had the metal trash can. I had to drag the fucking trash can out. Sparks were coming out. It was scarring up the asphalt driveway. Like, grr, grr. You know, uh, kids were having epileptic seizures because of the sound of the metal. Drag, 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 drag it out. Go ahead. At some point in 1997, somebody went, I have a fucking capital idea. What if we put wheels on a trash can? It was the same with fucking luggage. Nobody thought to put wheels on luggage. Nobody thought to put wheels on trash cans. Nobody thought to put wheels to move drywall. No one had any of these thoughts, and I'm telling you why. We like the punitive part of it. We like the punishment part of it. My stepdad used to look out the window while I was dragging that fucking trash can and beat off. He'd be like, look at him. <laughs> That fucker's miserable. <laughs> By the way, did you guys have metal trash cans when you were a kid? Yeah. I, I'll tell you the most humiliating thing that ever happened to my family, and my family was white trash, man. And we didn't, we didn't, we had furniture that my mom got from the curb and put put sheets over to upholster it. We drank out of fucking uh, containers we got at the 7-Eleven, you know, that had Steve Garvey's face on it, you know, like stupid, like get all the Dodgers trading cups and all this kind of shit. It was all white trash. It was all humiliating. But the most humiliating thing that ever happened is we would never throw anything out. And at a certain point, the trash cans would start to corrode. The bottom would like leak, you know what I mean? It would get all fucked up. The galvanized steel, they'd get all rusty. They're basically a, a tetanus shot waiting to happen. And at some point, if your family didn't have enough dignity to go out and spend $9 on new trash cans, the trash man would put you out of your misery. Like at a certain point, the guy would pick up the rusty, galvanized, dented piece of shit trash can with the tabs all bent in and the thing all fucked up from the time your stepdad backed into it drunk. And at a certain point, he would go, if you're not gonna do it, I am. And he would launch the entire trash can. The trash can would itself become trash as well. And then you'd walk out, try to salvage your dignity, like, hey, where's our trash cans? <laughs> uh, the trash man just fucking put it. This is essentially like old yeller. Like, he just put a bullet in the head of that trash can. He put it out of its misery. And you're like, well, what do you mean? We had like three more Thursdays left in that fucking bad boy. My stepson was gonna throw his back out, dragging that shit out for three more Thursdays. Come on. Glad he got used to dragging that shit around. Later on, he'll be dragging drywall around a construction site, so he'll be ready for this shit. <laughs> drywall, now do you guys know the origin of drywall, the history of drywall? Anyone who's torn apart a few houses knows they made laugh and then they put plaster on the lath. So drywall wasn't invented until like 1959 or something. Before that, in the 20s and 30s or whatever, they used lath. It's like little thin pieces of eh, probably like rough cedar or something like that. And then they put shit over it. They put the plaster over it. It was, a, it was a, they, these were craftspeople back then. These were drunken Irishmen who got a dollar a day to do this shit, but they were fucking proud. Later on, some genius said, why do we need to put the lath on and the plaster on it? Why don't we invent something called button board? This isn't funny, by the way, but it's informative. We will take... <laughs> Drywall, essentially, with divots in it, call it button board, we'll fucking do the whole thing in this button board, and then we will go ahead and put the plaster on top of the button board so we don't have to do all the lath work. And then at some point, somebody said, hey, genius, what if you just did the button board without the fucking buttons in it and we just called it a day? That became 
drywall. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Now, I could do 20 minutes on joint compound versus topping, but I don't want to... I don't, I don't want to bore you guys. All right, give me another one. Processed cheese and my mom. All right, we'll do them in that. We'll do them in that order. Uh, I'll do my mom first, because she's old. She may die before she hears this. I was... I got one COVID-19 joke out of this whole thing, which is about my mom. Uh, I don't like my mom. I don't like visiting my mom. I don't like hanging out with my mom. And so everyone is worried about their elderly parents, and my mom's elderly. So the one good thing to come of this COVID-19 business is I don't have to visit my elderly mom. And as a matter of fact, I'm this close to convincing her the virus can be spread over the phone. <laughs> that joke illustrates how much I dislike my mom. Processed cheese? Well, I've, I've never, I, I, uh, the love, I, I've, I've no love lost for uh, processed cheese. I never liked processed cheese. I don't like fucking fake anything. I've never understood. I don't like fake cheese. I don't like Sunny D. I don't like silicone titties. I don't like any of it. <laughs> silicone, uh, silicone tits are, I don't know, what, what do we call them now? Are they, uh, are, they're nice, but what are they? <laughs> they, they're saline bags now, right? Uh, you know what's weird is they have fucking, they have serial numbers on them. Somebody was telling me that uh, there was like a house fire and uh, a woman was trapped inside and she was burned beyond recognition and the only way they could identify her is through the serial number on her fake titties that were left behind. That's what they said, I know. We have a plastic surgeon here who doesn't agree with this story. Like, come on. Those titties wouldn't have made it through the fire. It's a good story, maybe it's not true. You try beating off to dental records. Yeah. Not that you have to beat off to uh, identifying remains, but you should. I'm only human. You're a weirdo if you do it to dental records. Yes, I do not like uh, American cheese. I don't like processed cheese. And uh, as I told you guys the last time I was in Texas, I said, let's get some good Tex-Mex because we're here in Texas. And we went to a good Tex-Mex place. And I said, I want cheese enchiladas. And they're always, here's the thing about uh, Mexican food. They're always trying to corrupt it. They're always going like, oh, would you like some uh, chicken in your cheese enchiladas? Like, no. Would you like some beef in your cheese enchiladas? No. Would you like some pubic hair in your, no. I want cheese enchiladas. There's a thing called enchiladas. There's cheese enchiladas. I like cheese enchiladas. I'm ordering cheese enchiladas. They brought cheese enchiladas and it had American cheese in it. Oh, for the fucking love of Christ. And by the way, you assholes out there always do this thing with me when I get something and it's horrible and I talk about the whole meal about how much it sucks and at the very end they go, well, you did eat the whole thing. Fuck you. Of course I'm going to eat the whole fucking thing. I'm a poor person from the San Fernando Valley. Those things cost $11. Yes, I'm going to fucking eat the whole thing. Fuck you. I was miserable the entire time. All right, let's do one more. What do we got? Dr. Drew. Dr. Bruce, Dr. Drew. Oh, Dr. Ruth. Dr. Ruth. She's the sex doctor, right? I used to listen to Dr. Ruth on the car radio many years ago, like in the 80s. You remember she had that syndicated radio show? And it was great because she had that little German accent and uh, she'd be talking about, 
you know, uh, venereal diseases and crabs and everything. And it was always weird. And she did that little like, she had this little high little German voice. And there's one story I remember, and it was it was the best. And I love, I love people who call into radio shows because people who call into radio shows are amongst the dumbest people on the fucking planet. They're always the dumbest. You know how they are? Like they go, first off, they, they always start off with something stupid. Like they go, uh, thanks, Dr. Ruth. It's good to meet me. You know, they always, they always get nervous and fuck up, you know? They give a fake name, you know? So they go like, Dan, line three. Dan, what's your problem? Dan? Dan? Oh, right. I named myself Dan. <laughs> my name's Fred, but I made up the name Dan because I wanted to rank on my fucking wife and how bad her pussy smells. But in the nine minutes I was on hold, I forgot my fake name. I love how dumb callers to radio shows. I, I did a radio show for 10 years. I fucking marveled how dumb all the callers were. But Dr. Ruth, th this caller took the cake because this caller, this was the best. Totally true. I'm, I, I remember where I was. I was driving my truck on the Ventura Freeway in North Hollywood, getting ready to get off on the Coldwater exit. It was like 1985, and a guy called in to Dr. Ruth's syndicated radio show, and he's like, Dr. Ruth, you know, I've ha I got my girlfriend. We've been having sex a lot, and uh, you know, we're not using protection. She's not on the pill. I'm not using condoms, and uh, you know, she's not pregnant. She's not getting pregnant, but uh, I don't know, I'm like a little, worried she might get pregnant because we're not using protection. And Dr. Ruth goes, well, do you pull out? <laughs> and the guy pauses for like a five Mississippi and he goes, well, yeah, when I'm done. <laughs> She thought he was asking me, you don't go to work with your dick in her? <laughs> and you like take a sweat jacket and just sort of place it between her puss and your cock and you just kind of walk sideways <laughs> into the restaurant. <sighs> All right, you guys, I want to thank you for coming out tonight. Thirty-second Geico here. Ah, right now, last but not least, Geico is offering you an extra fifteen percent credit on car and motorcycle policies. Fifteen percent on top of what you could already be saving if you're going with Geico. So, do uh, what are you waiting for? Get yourself set up and go with Geico. Never been a better time to uh, save a bunch on your auto insurance than uh, now at Geico.com. That is. Geico.com. All right, I want to thank uh, you guys for coming out tonight. I want to thank uh, Gina Grad and Bald Brian and John Holmberg. Until next time, this is Adam Carolla saying mahalo. It's time to break down the game film and look at the X's and O's, the K.O.'s and the O.N.O.'s from the world of sports. Bet Online presents All Balls, All Sports. Well, no sense in wasting any time. Let's dive right into a great week two of the NFL. There were some killer games, and we're going to have to, Gary Smith, start with the Chargers, your Chargers losing an absolute heartbreaker to the Chiefs, 23-20. Uh, so many ways they could have won that game. Uh, but you got to admit, Justin Herbert looked good. He had to step in for Tyrod Taylor. He looked like the future of the franchise. And this was a college quarterback who was considered iffy, in a sense, coming in. He was drafted high, but out of all the quarterbacks and athletes who were drafted, he was the guy like, can he put it together running and throwing in the bigs? And it looks like he can. Yeah. I mean, first, let me apologize to the fans with Adam and Tempe. I'm stepping in for, for today and tomorrow's episodes, but he'll be back on Wednesday. Fear not. But yes, Jeff, I got to agree. Uh, I 
screamed some four letter words and threw some stuff back in April when I was sure. watching the draft. I wasn't, wasn't wild about this pick. I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't pessimistic, but it wasn't the quarterback I wanted. We, we all right. knew the Chargers were going QB in their pick, you know, uh, right up there in the, in the top six or seven. And uh, this wasn't what I wanted, but I feel a lot better about it today. That's for sure. He looked great. I mean, he doesn't, I don't think he's ready to lead the team for the rest of the season necessarily to uh, the postseason and, and beyond the promised land right this second. But he, he stood in there, you know, throw for throw with the best in the business, right? Yeah. Yeah, he really did. No, no, but take us through the emotional pain. <laughs> well, the emotional pain. Uh, How many swear words is your, uh, is your child learning? Your child's oh, now. He's, a, he's about 14 months and he knows. 14 months. Almost all of them. Uh, you know, it was an emotional roller coaster of a day for me. Uh, I am, uh, I've become friendly with a f- friend of the show, comedian Rob Riggle, who is sure. a big Kansas City Chiefs fan. And uh, Rob likes to talk a little smack. And he and I are in a, a pick 'em league together. So we, we, uh, we do talk a little smack. And when it comes time for a Chiefs Chargers game, I started the morning with an email uh, letting him know uh, where I thought his Chiefs could go. And, uh, We went back and forth uh, most of the day because Rob is currently in quarantine in Australia waiting to do uh, the Australian version of his golf show, Holy Moly. So I think Rob had not much better to do than to talk trash with me over email. Wow. The Australian – hang on. Don't bury the lead here. The Australian version of Holy Moly. Yeah, you know the the ABC uh, putty – Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's a talking. sort of a variation of Wipeout, yeah, essentially, with golf, but played on uh, sort of with mini golf as the centerpiece, right? And uh, it's it's uh, here in America, Joe it's Tessator, Tessator, yeah, down. I can't remember who his co-host is, but it's a Tessator equivalent in Australia. But they keep Rob, <laughs> the Italian Joe Tessator. <laughs> wow, I didn't know that existed. That's impressive there. Uh, so, so now, did you at least get to talk some smack back on the fact that uh, KC was favored by eight and a half yes, and I barely did. won the game by three? Yes, I did. And, uh, you know, I will say the emotions were strong. Um, it, it, the game going into overtime added a little bit of extra stress because I had a family birthday to go to that night. And then there was a moment there where I thought I was going to have to leave before the game was over. So oh boy. Uh, the emotions were yeah. running high. But, you know, I will say that at the end of that game, I've, some things were thrown when a, a particular penalty wasn't called on, uh, I think it was Tyreek Hill, who... There was a guy who took his uh, helmet off. I almost said hat, just because that's how casually it looked when he right. flipped his helmet off. He looked cl- like he was just taking off a ball cap. He claims that it just came off, and I will say that, yeah, when you put your hand on the face mask and push upwards, it will just come off. Because that's what he did, and he wasn't flagged for it, and uh, that's what ended up tying the game was their ability to go for two there and uh, and and get it to yeah. seventeen all. Um, that's that right there is the sound of bitter acrimony. No, that right there, and is yet it probably should have been called. I mean, you know, I yep. would have to say if you look at both sides of that, that is a rule, and should have been. You're gonna call it. You gotta call it. Uh, yep. All right, let, let's let's allow you to recover a little bit. My uh, Packers looked amazing. Hey, yeah. let's go down everybody's teams. Uh, we'll talk about it later when when the whole crew's together. But uh, so my Packers look good. I won that one. Uh, 49ers obliterated the Jets, but they did lose both Raheem Mostert and Nick Bosa and Garoppolo for a little bit. Yeah, uh, but Ball Brian picked against him, so he's gone. And um, Brian loses uh, KC five ways because yeah, that, all his weapons yeah. and the game. Yeah, so he's he had a bad week. Yeah. He had a bad week. But l- let's dive into into outside of your game, yeah. maybe the most fascinating game, which was uh, the uh, Cowboys coming back from like twenty down against who else? The Falcons, who are known for blowing these giant fourth quarter leads. Now, I mean, they're they're really starting to become snake bit. They win forty to thirty nine. Tremendous play by uh, you know Prescott and and. Uh, and as uh, uh, Zeke Elliott, but little known kicker Greg Zerline, yeah, uh, pops off an onside kick that looked like a broken cat toy, yeah, just and rolling I, around on an unlevel. Let's watch. Man. This is this is how they win. This is how they beat the Falcons. Is yeah. the Falcons stood around? Watch this. Again. So here we go. Dallas needs this without time. No, nope, no tee. Zerline, no tee. He just kind of scoops it around sideways. 
I've heard it described as a watermelon pick. Round and round. And the Falcons, unexplainably. Wow. The Cowboys have it. Do you believe that? So nobody for the Falcons jumped on this ball. Four, uh, four, maybe five guys had a clean look at it, like uh, like perhaps a really badly wounded pigeon right. walking down the street where you go, hey, should we pick it up and help the pigeon? I don't know. Would you pick it up and help the pigeon? No. Why don't we ask this, these two guys if they would? You know, I would, but I think you should think twice about picking up a pigeon, as slow moving as it is, because you never know what kind of gym. Oh, somebody else picked it up. Oh, he's in a cowboy uniform. That's kind of how that whole thing went down. It was bizarre. And the coach, Dan Quinn, claimed everybody knew their rules they all had their jobs to do which is the first three guys are supposed to block and then the second two guys are supposed to handle it only if it's a high bounce and a weird kick and then they're supposed to go to their area he had this whole thing is schematic but when you watch the footage it's literally four Atlanta Falcons watching the ball. They're not looking to block anybody. They're not looking to take some responsibility in some other quadrant of the field. They literally are watching this ball bounce down slowly down the field without doing a thing about it. I've got to, I've got to correct just one word you said there. They're watching it spin because if it was bouncing, I can give a little bit of leniency for, well, you don't want to get too close because it can bounce off my knee and then it's live at, you know, before 10 yards, True. but they're just watching it spin. These guys are 250 and they lift. I feel like if you fall on it, you're probably going to be able to secure that ball pretty good. It's not bouncing. Yeah. It's just spinning. You put your, it's a dreidel off. kick. It's yeah. literally a dreidel kick, a poor, like a seven year old trying to spin a dreidel. That's what the kick was. Mm-hmm. Didn't use a T just laid it flat on its belly, the ball, and then didn't really even kick it. No, he just kind of, he literally like, you know, when you're going down the street and you go, is that a piece of gum? I don't want to step on it. It was that, foot move and if you look at the angle of it it for the first eight yards that it travels he kicked it at such an extreme angle it looked like it was going to get to the sidelines before it got to 10 yards it it, it well like yeah an yeah move. and then the uh the atlanta guys all kind of walked up to the ball like hey what's this is yeah. this a dreidel yeah, exactly. <laughs> and they just watched it they lose the ball dallas gets it dallas wins the game very sad. Uh, uh, but um, and the Atlanta owner, the uh, esteemed Arthur Blank, who is well respected in the league, just yeah. came out and said, essentially, uh, our players, he contradicted his own coach and said, our players did not know the rules Which and I- should have jumped on the ball. And uh, Quinn doubled down and said, our players did know the rules. And I, I think you got to read between the lines here what Arthur Blank to me is saying is don't bother installing the rest of that state-of-the-art solar system, Dan. You may be gone at the end of the year. I, at the end I'm, of the year. You can't do that. You can't do that. If I'm Arthur Blank, that's, uh, that's exactly what I'm thinking. Because, look, I, I appreciate Arthur Blank's honesty. Because I hate when these own – I understand being in lockstep with your staff and the guys you're paying millions of dollars and you want to project confidence. But you watch that footage, you know, twice – it's very apparent that at least two guys didn't know their job. Probably more like eight or nine guys, but I would say I would say four to five oh, yeah. for sure. Absolutely, did not know their jobs. Absolutely, I, I couldn't agree more. So, yeah. So yes, come out and and be honest with it and say yes. I am a, a football loving American as well. I've watched the footage. Clearly, those guys did not know their job, and it cost us the game. And yeah, start looking. Start. Start updating that CV there, uh, their coach, because uh, I'm not happy with that. Well, let's shift to something even weirder, uh, but more positive, which is the sport that may be going through the biggest revolution of all sports is golf, if you can yeah. believe it. Uh, Bryson DeChambeau just won the U.S. Open by six strokes, incidentally, has two other wins, four top 10 finishes already this year. And he's doing it all with this incredibly scientific, analytic approach that allows him to essentially pulverize the ball every chance he can get, cut dog legs, cut just hit right over the forest, uh, just completely hammer the ball until he gets it to the green, and then putt the hell out of it. Um, 
and he says it's all science and science has never let him down. He's 235 now and he wants to get up to 250. Yeah. And this is, if we could see, that's Bryson DeChambeau right now. That's, that's a essentially a number one golfer right now. He looks like, he looks like an MMA guy. He looks crazy. Oh, I, you see that guy, you, you don't, we don't want to catch that guy in an alley. That guy looks like he could beat the hell out of almost anything. And you know, Jeff, not, not for nothing, but maybe I'm getting a little old. My dad tried to get me into golf when I was, you know, back around 10 or 11. And back in those days, this is what a golfer that yeah. was 30 looked like. That's it's, what 235 what? looked like 15 years ago. Yeah. Cigarette, beer, wild pants. That's John Daly, of course. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, um, beer-filled man boobs. That Now, it's this cut guy. It's like beast mode. It's like Marshawn Lynch golfing. That's yeah. what Bryson DeChambeau looks like to me. And here's how he does it. He, keeps, he, he goes to the gym, lifts like crazy, works out like crazy, eats steak, and downs protein shake after protein shake. That's what he's into. And he says he keeps swinging as hard <laughs> as humanly possible. And he checks his launch monitors and his arc angles. And he just runs it all through the computer with the numbers. And he keeps taking aggressive lines. No one else in the field is going to take. Now, they thought it was going to catch up to him, Gary, at the U.S. Open. Everybody's kind of had a cockeyed approach to this. They've been looking at Bryson DeChambeau going, okay, I can see it on the Blue Monster, you know, Doral down in Florida. Just keep pounding, 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 wide open fairways. Uh, but they designed the U.S. Open specifically to be won by the chess players. It's, it's, you know, it's the one major championship that rewards accuracy over anything else. And he didn't play chess. He played Rock'em Sock'em Robots. He just went out there, won by six strokes. He pounded it. It's, yeah. That's like winning a football game by 40. Yeah. You win the U.S. Open by six strokes. That's crazy. To your point, I mean, there was a lot of guys out there who, who weren't even using their woods. They were out there trying to use two irons and stuff because the yeah. ways are so designed in such a way with such undulation that you have to be able to put it dead in the middle or it'll roll off and you'll, you're in a, a bunch of trouble with the long rough and the dew. But no, DeChambeau went out there. Yeah. And, you know, it, he, was playing, he was playing go while everyone else was playing checkers. It was crazy. You know, I like uh, uh, the uh, naked from the waist up look for, he should play that way. That would be super intimidating. You get a lot of sponsors for the ladies. That's for sure. Uh, <laughs> a couple of tattoos. What, yeah. Why not? Sponsor, right, right. The old sponsored tattoo sponsorship. All right. I think we're done. Do we have any odds for, uh, for um, coming up or do we need any odds? I, you know what? I think we're going to leave that to Ace and, uh, and Brian and Gina um, when they come back on Wednesday. We've uh, we got to go over there, bet the farm Friday. But I think that uh, that recap of how every one of them did. Oh, that's right. Yeah, we want to wait for bet the farm Friday. Yeah. Because uh, Brian's not going to be happy. No, he's not. Uh, so, um, hey, um, on behalf of uh, Gary Smith here, uh, it's Jeff Cesari, and that's it for All Balls, All Sports. All Balls, All Sports. Presented by Bet Online.